Hurling on Off the Ball. With Board Gosh Energy. Hurling. It's anyone's game. Now then, so uh, football grabbed centre stage over the weekend, I think it's fair to say, but we did have a double header at the Gaelic Rounds. Clare 526, Dublin 217, and then Galway 120, Tip 118. So our semi final lineup looks uh, eerily similar to last year. Once again, it is Limerick Galway uh, Saturday week, and then Clare Kilkenny will go again on the Sunday. Very up to say, Jamesy O'Connor, All Ireland winner with Clare, is with us. Jamesy, hello. Joe Hurtings Great and David Herity All-Ireland winner with Kilkenny now Kildare manager as well Hey David Joe how are you keeping? Yeah very well two point uh, winning margin for Galway Jamesy I think that flatters tip so flat so disappointing Yeah I mean it was a game Joe that you know we were all really looking forward to um, you know there's been nothing between them over the years and you know, you got the sense after the, the score that got, the tip ran up against Offaly that they were really going to bring a stiff challenge, but it never materialised. And tip were so flat, so poor up front, so bereft of ideas that um, I'm sure Liam Cahill and Mikey Beavens this morning are just scratching their heads trying to figure out where, where it went wrong. Uh, you know, there was, I think they scored three points in play in the first half, seven and all, and they were lucky, as you said, to be, you know, just the, just the three points in their ears at half time. And um, Conor Whelan obviously blew. A great goal chance. I mean, credit to Reese Shelley. He made he pulled off an unbelievable save. He was brave. He made himself big, but he knew very little about it. He went the leg and, and and you know looped over the bar. So that would have certainly been a better reflection. Um, you know the gap that seemed to exist between the teams at half time. But I mean, Gobba shot eighteen wides. I think. Yeah. Um, Keenan Fahey had another goal chance late on to, to put the game away. And uh, against Limerick, obviously they, they they won't be able to be as as wasteful as they were. But they were the better team by a mile. Henry got his tactics spot on and. Uh, Tip just just really failed to to deliver the performance we all thought was coming. David, on the tactics David, on the- that Jamesy mentions there, Shefflin spoke after the game, and he said that it would a view to the game. The Galway setup and the Galway attitude was first of all, don't concede. We're not conceding goals, and then make it a bit of a fight was what Shefflin said. Show them that we are up for this, that the Leinster final hasn't broken our spirit anyway. A bit of grit was the um, phrase he used. That sounded like the Shefflin you might have known once upon a time. Yeah, and we spoke with this the last day. That I was very impressed the way he spoke after the Leinster final. Like it's very easy coming on look, uh, and look completely dishevelled. But what's after happening, especially when the game was there, you know, you just had to clear one ball and you've won a Leinster title. But he came straight away on and he was very, very positive. I could, I could imagine he went back and, and he was the, he led exactly like he would in the dressing room and led them to kind of believe that, um, again, it wasn't the three games. Everyone spoke about Galway now have three games to win all Ireland. I'm sure they, just, they, they went back and they focused. You've one game to win and then we'll take on the next game again. And, uh, yeah, they brought out the, the, he was very clever as well. Keep the camp very happy. He said that he played a challenge match against the Clare subs on the Friday night, rested up the lads who played in that Leinster final. And uh, yeah, he has a happy camp going into it and they played extremely well. I'd say he is, he looked exhausted after the game because I, I'd say, you talk about there, he, he's such a consistent player when he played in his own days in everything that he did in his performances throughout the whole game even when he was with kind of Bally Hale as manager as well like they were so consistent they've obviously won two All-Irelands I think he won every single he won a, a, every single league club Leinster and All-Ireland with Bally Hale that he took on and now all of a sudden he's with a Galway team that even when they're eight points up when they're 12 points down against Dublin they can come back when they're eight points up against Tip they nearly blow it so he's I think he's just waiting for that one performance but when they can get like 70 minutes out of themselves and just really see where they're at. Yeah, James, he's not the first manager that's trying to imbue Galway with some consistency. So easier said than done. But in fairness to them, they turned up. And and like you get a real sense now, not least because it's Limerick in a semi-final, but also because they really should have put Tiberi to the sword and and much earlier in this game. um, They'll be going in there feeling very much as underdog again and with a lot to prove. I don't really know what you're meant to do when you've been wasteful, Jamesy. It's not like any forward goes out to be wasteful. I mean, here lads, next time finish the chance doesn't seem like the most helpful advice. No, and and I mean it's a bigger issue if you're not if you're not creating the chances, Joe. And I mean Tip couldn't seem to get any couldn't seem to get Jake Morris on the ball at all early on. I mean, you know, Anthony was getting was fifty fifty. And the really impressive thing 
from I suppose Galway and Henry's perspective was was how sound and solid they were defensively. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the the, the goals they can see in the Leinster the Leinster final, you could have driven a bus through the heart of that Galway defence at, at times. And and obviously they were they were keen that whatever else they were going to they were going to be hard to break down. And effectively, you know, it, it seemed as if both teams kind of had an extra defender at the back. And Colin Mannion sat really deep. I mean, I was sitting kind of just on that kind of forty five meter line, and he was at times he was nearly playing just behind the half back line. He'd taken one side of the field away and, and he got on, a, on, a, on an amount of ball and he's the guy you want to strip it because you know more more often than not he'll make he make good use of it um, why, so yeah why, I mean, why, why did no one spot that and say let's sit in Mannion for a few minutes and take him out of the game in possession well I think again like t- tip uh, probably had their own concerns at the other end I mean I thought for example in Ennis like the point Claire ran at that tip defence um, they caused them real problems and looked like they could get goals Cork looked like, like they could get goals I mean you know Rona Maher I mean, you know, the, the, a lot of the other defenders, um, you know, Michael Breen has paces, but outside of Carl Barrett, you, you just sense Brian O'Mara isn't exceptionally quick. They're good hurlers, really good guys on the ball um, and good coming forward, but not not blessed with blinding pace when they when, when they ran it. And Barrett, to me, didn't look either like he was 100% fit. I mean, certainly he didn't hit the levels that, that he, you know, you'd normally, you'd normally expect from him. So I think Tipper and Liam were probably, you know, quite happy um, you know, to have that kind of extra defender that safely valve at the back um, at the back as well. But that's ground when you're ahead. Mm-hmm. It's a different story when you're chasing the game. And and that's why, yeah, definitely I thought the tip had to had to try to um you know do a better job of engineering more space up front. And it was really as I said, only late on Joe, you know, when they started getting some ball into Jake Morris, mm-hmm. um, you know, he won a couple of frees and he was held scoreless and he's been their best forward all year, that they finally started to kind of get some kind of traction up front. And the goal gave them a lifeline that they didn't really deserve and and you're saying how is it possible there's only, there's only a point in this with, 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 with you know less than 10 minutes left on the on the clock but I think look, credit to Galway they, they saw it out and I mean you know Tom Monaghan came off the bench got three really crucial scores I thought Evan Island you know got on a lot of ball and was taken taking the right option you know didn't always shoot and he is a shooter you know laid, laid off the ball to guys in better positions Keenan Fahey got two points should have had a goal when Mannion teed him up later on with a brilliant pass um, but it's a bigger issue for Henry if they're not con- if they're not creating those opportunities yeah. Joe and they did and they've got they've got obviously Conor Whelan in brilliant form now 1-4 following up the 1-6 he got in the, the, the Leinster final Kevin Cooney's a player you know he's he's able to win his own ball he's good in the air he's set up Whelan for that goal chance before half time you know he's really a guy I think that's going to be there for, 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 for some time Nyland Concanon you know, Joseph Cooney had a big game. So, look at their, they know that they've been close to Limerick in the past. And, you know, if they can just, as I said, eliminate some of those, you know, those wasted opportunities, Joe, they're going to be right there in the semi final. David, maybe you're veering into Lark Corbett territory all those years ago, but on Mannion, when he's getting on so much ball and dictating things for Galway in possession, as a coach, would you have said to one of your forwards, well, look, Let's shut out Mannion and let you know let, let the the lesser distributor somewhere in that Galway backline let him be the free man. I'm not, I'm not sure how you dictate those terms. Yeah, it's finding the right forward um, to come out on top of Mannion. I'd say Liam Cad is probably looking back at that. He probably had so many problems all over the field that I'd say looking back and he he can't understand why he didn't do that. Um, the, Again, when you're, you know, I know there were eight points behind, but then they started coming back. You know, sometimes maybe it's a case they didn't go to, they didn't go in at half time too far down, so maybe they're thinking, yeah. okay, we, we've had a bad first half. Maybe if we just keep playing the way we're playing, we'll be able to pick off these few scores. Then they do go eight points down, and you're feeling then well, I can't take one of my forwards out to, to shut down Mannion. Maybe I need to keep my forwards up there, and then obviously you bring on. John McGrath, he gets the goal, you feel that swinging back in your way. And then and if that game had gone on for another three minutes, you know, you, you wouldn't back against Tipperary getting a, a win right at the end, albeit it, it wouldn't have been just like Liam Cal did. He did, he was very unanimous right after the, the match and kind of said that we got completely blown out of We didn't bring any kind of a, um, a battle to the whole to, to the whole game. I'd say that's going to be the biggest concern that he would have obviously with Watford last year the way things fizzled out and again with Tipperary this year but again I don't like it's in a way it's not really fair the Munster Championship and Leinster Championship is not fair like the Leinster teams can sleepwalk their way into a Leinster final the likes of Galway and Kilkenny get themselves right for that they have one good crack off it 
and then they can get themselves right for an All Ireland quarter final if they lose it. Tipperary have had like, have had ridiculous injuries there. If you look at the amount of cruciate there between Heffernan and Cadell, Brown, Morgan there throughout the year. They then have to go into a Munster Championship, and I know they're going to get a lot of um, probably get a lot of unfair stick for the fact that they've peaked too early. You, you can't but peak in Munster Championship. You know, a, a Cork coach said it to me. I was talking to him over the weekend. Uh, he said it's like throwing two badgers into a hole and letting them fight it out, and then when one of them dies, you get the one that lives. You take him out and you throw him into the next hole with another fresh badger and let them go at each other. And it's a uh, if, if Tipperary don't turn up for that first round of championship against Clare, should they, they they get blown over? They could be out of the they could be out of the Munster championship exactly like uh, Cork were or like Waterford were. It's just that I think with the string of injuries, the fact that it's the first year they're together, I, I think they, they have a lot to work on. I think the most disappointing thing is the way that they went out, a bit like Dublin in the other quarter final. There was just no bite or a bit of fight, and, and that's probably the, the most frustrating thing for Liam Gall. Thank you for using that deeply upsetting badger analogy. I think animal rights groups will really enjoy that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there was uh, there was a point you made there about um, the peaking, which is so interesting because Liam Cal's getting it from everyone, uh, David, and, and and I guess you're at the business end of trying to prep a team. So people are saying, well, Cal. You know, lightning has struck twice here. First Waterford, now Tip. You start seasons well, and then here we are. It, it kind of fades into nothing. Like I've, it, it, they had the three weeks before the Offaly game by dint of uh, making a mess of the Waterford game at the end of Munster. Liam Sheedy was saying last night that they had trained really hard, David, in November and December, and then you're into league. And as you said, Munster is very unforgiving. I don't know. I, I actually couldn't work out. Geez, I wonder if they trained really, really hard in these three weeks before the Offaly game and overdone it, or have they, are they are they undercooked, or it's just more a more prolonged fatigue because November is a long time ago. We we probably don't quite have all the answers until we're in the camp would you have a sense do you think listen to your initial answer my sense from you is it's just fatigue it's just they've had to go to the well week in week out on top of the league it is It's and that's it like even the, even that extra game against Offaly is just exhausting because you still have to go through all your work the mental preparation that week working on analysis getting everything right you, you know lads diet trying to build themselves up the nerves getting through the game it was in miserable conditions obviously picking up a few extra knocks as well it's that extra preparation is just a, a head wreck of a, what ended up being nearly a pointless game for them. And, and again, it did nothing for them because they, they because they shot the complete lights out. Everyone was talking about them. God, we were sitting back, did the extra bit of a break from the Leinster final, got a chance to regroup, have that challenge match for the subs and it's and come in kind of fresh into the match. Um, I, I just don't buy the whole fact that they peak too early. You have to peak in Munster Championship. If you lose that first game, you're out, you're basically, you're on the back foot of Munster Championship and you don't get out of it. Same as Waterford and same, same as Waterford. Uh, you know, Cork the same that they're out. Waterford, uh, Tipperary had to get out of the group and I'd say even when all is said and done, I know they've only won two games in the last two years, which is hard to believe and one of them was against, uh, against Offaly. I still think that it's been a decent first season for Liam Cad that they've got back to a, a management team. I think that the Tipperary people do love and know that they're they're the right men for the job. They've mm. got the, a strong, they've got a, a strong young team coming together. You look at even the fact that they drew with Tipperary, they drew with or they drew with Limerick, they drew with Cork, and they beat Clare. And you're talking about the two of them are probably favourites in you know, the All Ireland final now. So they've had a wonderful year. Mm. It's just the fact that it fizzled out, and everyone will live off that Galway performance. But they'll be back stronger in, in 2024. Jamesy, that's very much like the uh, understanding, uh, optimistic view of Liam Cal's first season in charge. Would you be as forgiving? Yeah, I think um, from a strength and conditioning perspective, uh, Tip didn't seem to be fit enough last year. That was that was certainly an issue, and I think that was one that they they, they felt that you know to compete with Limerick um, and Clare and Kilkenny and, and you know the Galways, the, the level it's at now, uh, you know, there's no quick fix. You have to put in the work. So there's no doubt that. They probably trained harder than maybe other teams, um, you know, over the over the winter. And I think maybe there was an element of a fatigue. Um, but then you look at you look at Warford as well and the way their season petered out. And maybe maybe that's a big question for Lehman and Mikey, like in terms of how, you know, did they just put put the players too through too hard or too rigorous a 
you know, whatever, whatever it was, you know, before those games. But I mean, they were they were really sharp for the first game in Ennis Joe. I mean, that's on day one. You know, like they were absolutely championship ready mm-hmm. and came to Ennis and were, as I said, were were at it from the off. So I mean, there was nothing wrong. Um, with them on that day certainly the Limerick game um, seemed, seemed to take a huge amount out of them and, and you know other teams have found that to their cost as well I mean no better example of that than Clare last year in the Munster final I mean Clare were emptied um, you know physically and emotionally after last year's Munster final so I mean Tip were so flat against Waterford when you know I mean everyone made the assumption that Waterford it, it was just a, a fait accompli that Tip would you know get the job done and look forward into a Munster final against Clare so psychologically to lose that game as well you know feel that you blew it you blew a glorious chance to, to, to get to a Munster final I think that maybe had a debilitating effect as well on, 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 on the players and but for whatever reason certainly I mean, Galway were clearly up for it. Yeah. Um, tip were nowhere near their best, and and, and I'm at a loss, and I, I'm sure the manager yeah, there. And sometimes, Joe, that can yeah. just happen. You know what no, I mean? No, listen, it just, I, I hear no. you. I, it's just it's so surprising. I because I, I understand five weeks ago they have a great shot at Limerick and it takes a bit out of them and that's a good explanation for what happens against Waterford. But I I don't understand David how like nursing a few beers on a Monday or Tuesday they're sitting together and they're saying fellas three week run we'll take care of Offaly we've got four weeks here to get right for for loser of Kilkenny Galway I, that, that part I don't understand how they could just be so flat and, and again I'm asking you to go inside the camp and explain what happened but I don't know I, I just think it's enough time to get yourself up, get, get yourself up for it it's a bit of a mystery it can be it, it, it could be a simple case of Going back and, and realizing the training schedule, I don't know. They, yeah. they could have over. They could. They might have overdone it. But that's that's what every team is different. They could have done the same thing with you know Waterford two years ago or three years ago. They got to an honor and final, and, and it seemed to work. It's just if this is a young team, if you're if you go back and, and just say you do a certain amount of training with a team, and all of a sudden you lose all those lads we spoke about there with the cruciates and yeah. and even Shane McCallan and enough injuries there throughout the year, and even the concussion there with Carl Bart there, you could do the exact same training with a team from one year to the next, but different players and younger players could exhaust them more. It could be it could be a case that they have to go back and kind of look at it and go, Jesus right, we need to kind of taper back a little bit more next mm. year. Mm. Um, but I, I do think that off the game, everyone was was harping them up. When you when you're scoring so freely and scoring three twenty five in a first half of a match, you know you're, you're buzzing, and then all of a sudden when the scores aren't coming, you're not creating goal chances, you're not getting them. You know, not until the obviously the John McGrath goal that does seep the confidence out of you as well. Um, that that. You, you're not scoring as freely, but I think all we have to deserve massive credit for. Like we again, James, you said there about driving the bus down to the the the, the middle of Galway. They were outstanding in the way that they defended on uh, on Saturday. Like any time at all, the ball went into the full back line. You had the half back line straight away coming back and cutting off the D. They didn't create any goal chances. They were extremely well set up. They barely got a, a shot on goal. I can't remember Aidan Murphy having to, to pull off anything really, anything decent, uh, save boys. And the only goal that went in was a small bit of a mix up there between Greedish and himself. They weren't too sure whether the, the actual display shot was going to land all the way into the keeper or not. So I think Galway deserve massive credit for the energy. I, I thought. I thought work rate wise if you were asking again you, you spoke about Henry Shefflin yeah. he was just known for the amount of work that he did out on the field and driving everyone else along and I thought that the Galway forwards were absolutely outstanding the way that they closed down the Tipperary backs around midfield as well the amount of hooks that they got in and turnovers that they got in I thought Tip didn't bring any physicality to it mm-hmm. until or unfair enough when they got that goal and turned over Carole McInerney when he was coming out and then set up the goal yeah. I thought this Galway were up for Tip weren't so Jamesy, let's let's uh, kind of glance ahead to Limerick Galway then. Absolutely, everybody in agreement. Galway's work rate was excellent in terms of quality, though. Like I, I was very disappointed with the game. I was a bit like everyone looking forward to it. There was probably a period in the first half where Galway were pretty aimless in possession, uh, gifting balls to Noel McGrath. A few pot shots, they go wide. It was just, just what you know. You're thinking this hasn't really caught fire. And then you've mentioned the conversion rate, the 18 wides, the the number of goal chances they didn't put away. I just thought, like in in quality terms they're going to have to be so much better against Limerick so I don't know how much how much to read into uh, Saturday beyond there's a bit of life in them whatever about the quality I know and I think Saturday was you know was 
all about get all about the results. It was about going to Limerick, you know, obviously putting the Leinster final loss behind them, the manner of it, and, and and just taking care of business. And and they did that. And I mean, in, in, in many respects, Joe, it's a far better place to be heading into. If they'd shot the lights out and beaten Tip by fifteen points, to be you know talked up about, mm. uh, you know, been favourites to beat Limerick and all the injuries Limerick have and so on. So I think it's a good place to be. That they know themselves that, yeah, there's no way you can be that inefficient um, against Limerick because they do, they simply just don't give you those same opportunities. You know, so I think it's a good place to be in. In terms of an at the game, Joe, it was just, yeah, we were all looking forward to this and the wides just sucked all the energy out of the ground because right. I think Galway had nine, eight or nine in the first half. Noel McGrath had those three long range efforts in a row yeah. early on. That, that, like that normally doesn't happen. I mean, normally he's money for those and, you know, I think he, he, he'd another wide and, and then he was taken off and it just wasn't his day. Jason Ford then, Noel set him up with a brilliant ball over the top, you know, that he came in from the right hand side, Joe, and he, he flashed that shot just past the post. That was the one good goal chance the tip, um, the tip created early in the second half and had that gone in it might have it might have sparked him into life but um, yeah from a goal perspective all about the results loads to work on loads to improve and Limerick I mean they've played Limerick enough often enough now to know um, you know and there's enough evidence there uh, you know from this year's Munster campaign you know the games obviously Galway have played in the league even this year in terms of you know what what, what are the teams that have have taken Limerick to the line like what what, what have they done well what, where's you know where have they where have they made those marginal gains? And, you know, like Limerick, you know, in the past has been pick your poison. Um, you know, if you, if you, you know, if the half back line sits, Morrissey, Hagerty and whoever else, Keen Lynch, just, you know, score eight or nine points in the half hour line and, and, and beat you that way. And um, if you follow those guys out to feed and leave 80 or 90 hours of space in front of Glenn and Flanagan, <laughs> they're the ones likely to, to beat you. So, you know, it's 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 a matter of going out deciding, you know, OK, what did Clare do when they beat them earlier on? What did they do in the Munster final? Because Clare had the opportunity to win that game in the Munster final. And what did we do well last year? What did we not do well last year? And this 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 plenty of information and, and knowledge and, and plans that, that certainly Galway, um, Galway can, can, can address. And I, I, like Galway at their best, Joe, um, you know, are they good enough to beat Limerick? Uh, I, I think they are because Limerick, without Hannah now, we don't know where Keane Lynch is at. Yeah. Um, Sean Finn is obviously gone. You know, they'll, they'll have to rejig things at the back whether Dan Morrissey goes to six and Richie English comes in. Um, but certainly their reserves are, are going to be tested um, more than they have and Galway will see this now as a glorious opportunity given that Limerick okay they're winning these games but you know the Munster final is that I went under the bonnet Joe and Clare had the opportunities to win it um, and, and just you know it, Clare probably had 20 chances that they didn't take and Galway that, that's what happened Galway on Saturday night so correct that and they're not going to be too far away David James he outlined some of the tactical decisions Shefflin will have to make what way do you think he'll go against Limerick? I think the fact that Declan Hannon is missing is gives them a massive chance. Like he is the he's the playmaker there. If I've never seen a video before a few years ago of uh, Galway versus Limerick and just the way that they play, the amount of ball that he gets on, his ability to be able to read, sit back in the pocket, be able to switch play. He is the hunter at the back, um, and, and I think that if. In, I know whenever I spoke about Dublin being absolutely outstanding there for years, I remember thinking like, well, if you take out Brian Fenton and Cluxton and possibly Con O'Callan, like there there are there are certain players that every team needs for them to click. And if you were to look down through, um, if you were to look down through the Limerick team, you would straight away say Keane Lynch, Sean Finn, and Declan Hannon. Straight away, those are kind of three out maybe the top five lads you would take out to say that straight away that they would be uh, definitely weakened. Or, you know, even you look back in the year, Kenny lost the, the five in a row. Brian Hogan was out of centre-back. Sheffield was playing with a cruciate centre-forward. You take out some of the key pillars out of your team, you're not going to be as strong. It just gives Galway a little bit of hope. I still don't think that there's enough consistency out of the forwards. If uh, Limerick managed to keep Conor Whelan quiet, obviously he's had two outstanding games. But again, and I was disappointed. Like I said, Kevin Cooney never backed up without the, the Leinster final. Brian Concannon as well didn't didn't get going and obviously was taken taken off then as well. Obviously Tom Monaghan did very well and he came on. But the, the other kind of thing is that I've got we won a, a match in Crow Park since 2017 since they won the All Ireland final. I know they've they've lost to Dublin, they've drawn with Dublin, they've lost to Kenny in, in three Leinster finals. They've had a miserable record in in Crow Park and that's even one of those difficult things it's like Mayo in an Northern football final it's hard to kind of get over that and kind of mention that you know this is the time 
it's going to work for us. Uh, that's why I thought it was a golden opportunity for Galway against Dublin in the Leinster Championship. If they'd have gotten a win, that would have been that hoodoo out of the way. The mm. fact that they drew, so was that still hanging over their heads heading into this game? They do have a chance, but there's no, I don't know, I think James did a very good job there in trying to make it sound like uh, Galway have a chance. I still think, I still think it's all, it's Limerick's there to lose. Uh, Henry Shefflin was asked, uh, David, and you'd have a good feel for Shefflin, the person behind the scenes. He was asked about Galway 12 months ago um, and now, and he said, we're more comfortable together. The relationship between us is stronger, which was kind of an interesting line. Uh, Shefflin as a presence around a camp, and I know it's different to Shefflin as a player and manager, are very different roles, but what was your sense of Shefflin, the person around the Kilkenny camp? Was he... Uh, very much the spiritual leader around the camp or just one of the lads or a man apart no he he wasn't one of the lads and I, I don't mean it Shefflin was the god basically around the place it, it, I don't think it made any difference if if you were if you were cracking a joke and Shefflin laughed you'd nearly nudge the lad beside you to, you know Shefflin has, has laughed at my joke like, as in he, he was He's that much. He was that much of a legend. Like we we had a, a WhatsApp group. We set it up in the February. That's when WhatsApp groups weren't too fit. You know, yeah. Th- this was a, probably the first WhatsApp group, and uh, he was the last lad to join. He was ex- he's extremely he's extremely sensible. Um, he doesn't do anything wrong uh, at all. He is the he's the most. He is just a, a perfect. I'd say father, husband, everything. Well, you, you just, you know, he didn't join the group because he wasn't too sure what the group would be about. And he, he's so conscious of everything he does and how he acts. Uh, geez, again, I, I think back to we were up in Carton House one year, and the, the Irish, um, the Irish rugby team were up there. They had uh, all their gym equipment, everything was there, and we were watching the Dublin footballers run after us in Carton House, and uh, one of the one that the Dublin footballers kicked the ball over the bar. I remember getting it and then seeing that the Irish tent was open. And uh, behind the goal, now that had absolutely every single Irish bit of gear, had between medicine balls and between uh, jerseys, the works. And we, uh, I, I suppose, made a comment and kind of go, the tent is open, lads. So we, we got a few, it was Kellogg's Rice crispy those bars anyway, and we were happy enough with it. And everyone went away and we had our meal. And then everyone, slowly but surely, after the meal, then kind of slipped away and going, are you going out to the pitch, you know, on their own at the time? And everyone off in their groups and absolutely fleeced the tent. Like, took everything and anything that they possibly could out of it. Like, I'm talking heading back in and uh, seeing little shorts and kind of rugby medicine balls kind of job. But Chef came out and it was myself and Owen Murphy were, were playing a bit of soccer. And Lester Ryan... And we we took a football out of the tent. We took football out of the tent, played around with it, and we're walking away with it. And Chef goes, just, you know, passed the ball, took the ball off it, and brought it back over and put it back into the tent. Like even regardless of the fact that nobody was around, nobody was doing anything. I know that's probably a, a bit of theft and all that crack, like. But it was just the fact that it was. <laughs> he, he was kind of looking at him, going, even when there's no one around, he just he will do everything to absolute perfection. He is just. He's just, he's constantly looking after himself and making sure that everything is done right. And I can only imagine that he's bringing that to the, mm. that level of honesty to the, to the Galway dressing room as well. If you look as well with, he did, he, I mean, I've no doubt that the group is stronger because he only took over the job in late October. Like to take over an inter county team in late October is, I remember just thinking, because he had still had a club uh, semi final with Thomastown coming up, he would have to ring at least. I'd say 45 people for a backroom team of about 30. And then you'd have to ring your about 70 players to try and get his 45 players together. By the time all that's in and together, you're looking at Christmas. You don't have a pre-season whatsoever. He has nothing there really together. And then you're straight away into league and then championship and the way everything is condensed. He probably had about six decent months. And by the time you actually got to know them and got to know their families. And there's so many things as a manager. You have to know what lads are doing in college if they're married, if they have girlfriends, what the, the 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 mental side of things. But lads, geez, if if they've had, they need to talk to the psychologist. Their injuries, it, it, it's just such an, a, a, a a massive amount of workload he would have had to take on last year mm. and not have a chance to go to any really any of the club games whatsoever again. 
um, and, and have a proper look at what's available in Galway and see the lads that are actually working. Some lad might shoot one in ten in a club game and everyone's telling you how good he is, but for Stefan to go and see him and kind of go, he doesn't work off the ball, he's grand free taker, but they, there's all these little things that he would have had a proper pre-season that's why I was so disappointed from that he didn't win the Leinster final just I'd be disappointed for him more than obviously Galway I, I don't care there but it's it's I know how much he puts into it I know the kind of person he is and uh, I've no doubt that the Galway lads will put in an incredible performance for him and well there is a degree of water under there the bridge about this question but I'd just be curious given your, your great sense of him the decision to manage Galway against a Kilkenny and then for the whole Cody handshake thing to blow up the way it did what effect would all that have had on him it's, it sounds like you would have just hated all of that wattage and noise around all that yeah absolutely hated it yeah it, it would because it's yeah, which, yeah, look, he's had a very tough he's had a very tough you know two years like with Paul passing away his brother as well like that that is massive like that's yeah. and for him to be have, and again he has he has such a, a young family. He has five kids as well, and to be driving three hours up to Galway and back, and obviously have that bereavement in the middle of it, and then all of a sudden, then to to have kind of that handshake, someone that was seen as a as a very much a, a massive figure in his life for his whole senior into county career, for that person to kind of treat him in the way that he did and bring that kind of negative attention on him so close after a bereavement. Uh, I can only imagine that it had a massive impact on him and then to double down on it in the Leinster final it was uh, and for Henry to have to go over to, to Brian and shake the hands it, it could have just have been sorted out it didn't work it, it obviously there's an underlying thing there the fact that Brian asked him in onto the panel and Henry wouldn't go in and, and Brian didn't like that at all and didn't like the fact then that he would turn him down and then take over uh, in Kilkenny um, it's it, it, it would have an effect on him because he is an emotional man and when he does talk Henry he is very close to tears if he gets emotional about it on a Friday night before a match in a dressing room he will get very very close to tears that's, that's, that, that's the kind of man that he is he's emotional he's passionate in everything that he does well, we might come back to that at some stage. Amazingly interesting career on so many fronts. I do have to take a very short break and I want to chat about Clare against Kilkenny in the other semi-final and uh, get your sense from both of you about what's happened to Dublin because I think a decade ago we were would have been saying, well, just wait and you see what Dublin will be like very, very soon and, and it just hasn't happened. We'll take a short break back with uh, Jamesy and David in one sec. Hurling on Off The Ball With Board Gosh Energy Hurling, it's anyone's game Hurling on Off The Ball With Board Gosh Energy Hurling, it's anyone's game You're welcome back David Herity and James E. O'Connor with us So we have Claire and Kilkenny all over again James E. We'll come to that in a moment Just a word on Dublin Because I, I think, what, about a decade ago They were feeling like such a significant addition To a championship that is crying out for new big teams For obvious reasons And my memory of that period is uh, the general sense that well wait till they continue to harness all their natural advantages and look what the footballers are doing give this another 10 years and Dublin are going to be a force to be reckoned with and it feels like they're almost ebbing along or even away slightly I don't know what's gone wrong there yeah and I suppose um, you know I, I remember Joe watching the Dublin Miners um, and seeing Kieran Kilkenny and Cormac Costello and Eric Lowndes and you know all these guys, um, most of whom opted for opted for the big ball, and uh, how did that work out for them? You know, <laughs> that worked out okay. I think yeah, it worked out pretty okay. I'd say not too many regrets. Um, but even Kula winning that Ireland club, I mean, Con Con was just devastating. You know, I mean, uh, nigh on unmarkable at times. Uh, you know, so I mean, look at if 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 all those guys. Uh, we're back in the fold it's, it's arguably a different story I mean we know how important it was for Dalo to get Conal Keeney back and the lift that gave the group and obviously the leadership and you know all the, all the other things he brought to it I mean he was he made a massive contribution um, you know to that, to that team and, and over a decade over a decade ago so like Michal 
obviously then you know you factor in the players that weren't available this year you know Keno Callahan and Liam Rush and, and Chris Crummy I mean these were guys that you know were the backbone of that defence um, and that's that's half your starting you know first choice defence show gone you know experienced players guys that were I'd imagine good trainers leaders uh, you know so so it wasn't easy for me Hall and then you know on, on Saturday evening you lose Donald Burke you know after eight minutes um, you know, missed the first free. Looked like he slipped as he was taking the first free. He got a chance shortly after it. Again, slipped or lost his footing as he as he was about to shoot. Both chances that you'd normally expect him to nail, they didn't go over. Then he's hobbling off the pitch. And I'd say from a from a player's perspective, I mean, Dublin probably knew. Look, they needed everything to go right. They needed Donald Burke on the field of any chance against Clare, and maybe a little bit of the heart went out of them. Um, you know, to see you know your marquee forward, the guy that's really stepped up for the last couple of years to be honest about it and, and, and done the bulk of their scoring I mean lethal from play as balls and you know good from play as well so he was to lose him was a grievous blow but uh, you know the, certainly Joe they, they they appear to be you know plateauing mm. um, now look it did well this year obviously to, to, to you know be the third place team make it to the quarter final um, but tactically I think Michal will look back and say yeah look we got it wrong here I mean the man marked Tony Kelly Paddy Doyle picked him up you know he's athletic but Tony started thinking centre forward and it meant then that when he moved and Paddy went with him you could have driven a fleet of lorries not to mind the bus to the heart of that Kilkenny defence or to that Dublin defence and David Fitzgerald I mean in his athleticism um, he came down the middle time after time that first half he set up Tony's second goal set up um, Mark Rogers' goal got a couple of scores and, and, and arguably could, one, or, one of those could have been another goal scoring chance so um, yeah combination of things but certainly they don't seem to have the same talent coming through I mean they, you know they haven't been contesting an Ireland minor finals or minor, Ireland minor semi-finals uh, and you know while they've got a lot of good players decent players they don't have the elite players or enough of them that you need to win uh, you know to win the big um, the big prizes and that's that's obviously an issue and Michal you know had them competitive I mean they were competitive against Kilkenny obviously they were really competitive against Galway but Clare were up for uh, on Saturday and um, and Clare played well um, and, and look at it was really positive I mean I thought from a forest perspective they looked dangerous they looked like they could get goals um, but like you know at the same time Dublin were so flat you can't read anything into it because it's obviously a much stiffer challenge um, you know two weeks away Yeah. and Clare have big ground to make up Herdy was talking us up last year Joe or a, a few minutes ago there I, I, I didn't get into to take up on it but talk about a clear lyric on Ireland <laughs> it was 226 to 20 points last not last year 170 to 6 points at half time now listen don't get me wrong clear in a way better place um, in terms of uh, you know I said this to you the last time I was on that the Munster final took such an emotional and physical toll last year that's certainly not the case this year um, you know the players I think you know learnt a lot from that uh, they're in a much better place physically and mentally but the injuries are a concern and we didn't have John Connor last year and, and you know he was sorely sorely missed Connor Cleary obviously I'd imagine he's a major doubt at best it's touch and go and, and he'll have obviously nothing or very very little done Conlon went off with a really bad knock I'm hoping that he'll be okay Dave McInerney's carrying a knock Ed McCarthy's a quad problem that doesn't seem to to, to, to want to go away uh, Shane O'Donnell rolled his ankle he came off so we're going to need all those guys now I know Kilkenny have a, an equally lengthy um, you know injury list as well I mean given the players that, that weren't available to you know Derry for the Leinster final Adrian Mullen and Mikey you know Mikey Carey cried off um, you know etc 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 so uh, you know both sides might be depleted but Clare would need everybody I think uh, you know to beat Kilkenny and like the one concern for me is that aerially you know Cleary we need Cleary back there we yeah. don't match up well with the threats that Kilkenny have and, and there was an element of Kilkenny maybe going back to old school values and route one with the players they've, they've got they're not prepared to, to lorry it in high and, and like whether it's TJ whether it's Walter Walsh whether it's own Cody they're all good in the air they're all able to win their own ball and um, we're not blessed with you know like you know you take the weekend Darrell Lohan made his, made his championship debut um, but Shane Amore Paul Flanagan Rory Hayes None of those guys are six feet three, mm. um, you know, and, and, and you know, aerially 
dominant you'd say you know they're all good players in their own right so that that would be a concern for me so we're going to need all all those guys that weren't available or, or, or that we lost at the weekend back for uh, for two weeks time David I'll get your sense of that game in a moment just on Dublin um, yeah I mean even anecdotally and it's not an anecdotal point you can't leave your head like, so I, I live north side like just kids cycling to training with hurls left right and centre people poking around like the game feels uh, genuinely in a very, a very alive and a very vibrant place so I don't know why it's not quite happening for them it is. And if if you look at uh, the club championship, it's probably the most exciting club championship, I'd say, arguably, in the country. It, it's it's so competitive between Crokes and Athena and Kula and Bowden. And then you've kind of Vincent's Luke and Bridget kind of just off that as well. It, it's For me, the, the reason why Dublin haven't progressed is simply they, they haven't had consistency of management. Um, it's obviously Anthony Daly left. They brought in Jared Cunningham. I came in in Jared's final year as, as goalkeeping coach. He'd have brought me in, so I, I kind of just have a small bit of background kind of knowledge on what was going on there. Uh, I think Jared's philosophy was to, he probably needed maybe a, a term, maybe three, four years to try and bring this Dublin team through and to try and develop the young lads. And even if you looked at it, he would have brought in the likes of Derek Gray and Fergal White there, Connor Burke, lads who would have been playing there the weekend. He was the one who first introduced them in and onto the panel and he had a senior panel he had a second team as well of kind of between the between the twenty ones and weren't quite senior. He was managing that team, and then Johnny McGurk, who was also a selector there, was over the under twenty. So they had a conveyor belt, and he had put it through a conveyor belt uh, there. I suppose the thing with Jer is that he, in order for him to probably have the to put Dublin on the on the pathway, he got rid of a few big names out of that squad, the likes of uh, I suppose Paul Ryan and. Um, you know, Alan Nolan would have been another one there that, that went missing. That there's there are not that that was that was asked to, to kind of leave the panel, and uh, I suppose between different things, then again, it it it, it didn't go well with kind of the, the interviews and kind of that th- things weren't great within the camp and so on. And, and obviously, people were talking of being toxic and septic. Uh, the kind of atmosphere in there, Jer was then let go for one reason or another at the end of that year. And they brought in Pat Gilroy, who then brought back a lot of the older lads in onto the panel. And by all accounts, there was there was great vibes there that the lads were, you know, they brought back in the likes of Paul Ryan and Al Nolan as well. And uh, and everything was going well, and he'd given everyone a chance, and he'd had the kind of the north, south, east, and west kind of the the those kind of uh, blitzes there before Christmas and everyone was buzzing and Jesus the schedule I remember it was something like he really kind of wanted to weed out who the good lads were and who weren't and he was remember the January schedule was 27 trainings out of 31 mm-hmm. we were seeing one of the lads had the, the calendar with him one night and uh, the problem was Pat had did a very good first year but then left because of his job so now you're on to manager number three and Matty Kenny coming in in that in the third year Matty, who would have been second choice to Pat Gilroy. And then after Matty's first year, 11 of Matty's backroom team left. So now essentially you're starting again, yeah. heading into the fourth year. So all I, that I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit demoralised listening to you with that schedule there, yeah. You know, you're heading into then COVID years, so there's no consistency in any kind of a training or getting together whatsoever. And then Matty leaves, and now you're on to me all the So if you're asking why they're not progressing, if you look at John Kiley or you look at Brian Cody or... You know, even Brian Lowen, just look at those, the, the, the teams that were getting to last year's semi-finals. You're looking at a management team that are together, that know each other. And like we spoke about there, Shefflin, getting to know the players. They just never really did. Dublin have never really progressed or had a, a steady management team together. That's why I think Miolo Dunne, who was an excellent choice, but he's going to need, Jesus, he would need five years before that Dublin team is going to gonna do anything, right, really. Right. Before it's going to really start building and he needs the time and I know they've put in place an under 20 team to kind of nearly take over like Shane O'Brien is there he used to be over Westmead if Derek McGrath in as as, uh, as coach and then they have Graham Byrne who was a Wexford s and coach used to be with Dundalk as well he's in there with the under 20s so they do look like they have a, a plan put in place that John Costell nearly won the last things he did before he was going to leave was put this kind of this plan a six year plan in place but for me Neil who has to kind of stay he has to be given the time he was rock James he mentioned some lads there you you could add Mark Shute to that. The trolley are left as well. Sean Moore, Sean Tracy, David Tracy, they're left. Liam Rush. These are outstanding players that have just that uh, aren't available. Ron Hayes there this year as well. Absolutely beasts of men that you need to bring in all these younger lads underneath. But the likes of 
you know, Donald Burke is still nearly left on his own up front and it nearly becomes too easy then just to try and man-mark him. Um, but that's that's where Dublin are at. I think they're nearly starting back, unfortunately, back to year one, which is this year. And hopefully then Neil going to get the time to bring Dublin back. But he's in need at least, I think, half a decade. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, so Kilkenny to smash Clare by 10, David, or how do you see it? I do think a lot depends on... Jesus, if Mikey Butler can can mark Tony Kelly again, like, Jesus, he would do well for two, you know, twice in a row to be able to keep him quiet. Um, Adrian Mullen, I think, is massive. He's back gripping a hurl by all accounts, which is huge for Kilkenny. Um, the big thing for them then is, do you kind of risk him in a semi final, knowing that if he gets a belt, he's missing a final? But I think you just have to go flat out and make sure that he's playing in that semi-final because David Fitzgerald, to me, is as close to a Michael Fenley as I've seen in years. Will O'Donoghue is, is very well. Just that ability to be able to win a ball and burst through a defence and put a, a, a team on the back foot. The fact that Shane O'Donnell, I, 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 Mark Rogers as well, that they're actually properly standing up. It's not just the Tony Kelly show anymore. These lads are you know a, a proper supporting cast I think Kenny have a hell of a lot more headaches than they would have had this time last year I think it, like we said last year is going to be an absolute rip roar and classic I do think so again my only thing is I do I thought that Considine when he got the goal for Dublin and then even Paul Crummy as well caused Hassan in the Dublin for four and any time the ball went in even the Keno Sullivan uh, ripping through for the goal uh, I think if you have the likes of Mossy Cohn Owen Cody these lads taking uh, clear on if they get enough decent ball in I think that clearful back line definitely need Conor Cleary back there to try and cement it yeah yeah um, I'll give you a final word on, on Clerical Kenny Jamesy I mean uh, Lowen's been there a while now I, I presume uh, I'd, I'd defeat to Kilkenny doesn't put him under pressure there's a there's a sense in the county he is uh, progressing and progressing nicely like, cause, like for Shefflin or, or Cahill the weekend just gone very defining uh, where, where is Lohan and Clare? Oh, the, the job is his for as long as he wants it Joe I mean we're in the last four yeah. in what's a brutally competitive championship um, you know even, even to get out of Munster again and, and you know we, look, we've been in the last two Munster finals uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, this pressure. I'd say, you know, Brian maybe feels the pressure to deliver silverware, and that's that's that. But that's coming from himself. I mean, Clare supporters, we're having a great run. We had a great year last year. Yeah, desperately disappointed coming out of Croke Park that the team didn't, you know, didn't do themselves justice. I mean, it wasn't. I don't think any Clare supporters were disappointed for themselves. They were disappointed for the players, um, given the work that they, they they put in, and it was just disheartening that we just didn't turn up on the day. I think we'll turn up in two weeks' time. Now, whether we're good enough remains to be seen but no the, the job is Brian's for as, as long as he wants it I think he's I think everyone appreciates the, the work that's, been, that's going in mm. um, in my eyes he's doing a great job he's getting the best out of what's available and Claire Hurling I mean Joe had a great year the 20s were you know right there in the, the Munster final with Cork um, you know gave a great account to themselves obviously the Miners won the All-Ireland um, you know were narrowly beaten on penalties in last year's finals so you know Clare Hurling is in a good place in, in, in that sense that there's, there's young talent guys want to play for Clare they want to wear that Clare yeah. jersey we've got great people involved with the teams and um, yeah I mean uh, like Brian as I said if, if, if we can get if we can get those injured players back yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think we have a chance I think yeah. like, look it's only a chance I mean you've got to appreciate how close Kilkenny were um, to beat Limerick last year um, and if Kilkenny back, get back to the levels that they hit last year you know we're going to have to play to our absolute level best mm. um, you know to be there but we have a chance and we have a forward line you know Rogers is a is a serious throw in um, you know I think he's 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 going to go on and become a top player for his show I mean you know 1-6 he's back on the freeze I've been crying out for that <laughs> you know I think I think he's our most natural free taker now Aidan McCarthy's done an okay job but Rogers to me is just a guy that, that looks like a you know a 95% free taker so um, you know he was on them at the weekend and, and, and you know, nailed five missed one I think uh, you know but Tony Tony doesn't have to carry the, the whole load up front now Shane's in good form Peter Duggan again is, is a handful and uh, you know we've got guys who can come off the bench as well David Reedy was back as well He that was his first bit of action Joe so they got they got 20 minutes into him at the weekend Shannon came off the bench um, you know so we have we have options but unfortunately it's at the back um, that we're going to need everybody and is that Dave McInerney mm. you know not starting the weekend John Connell and obviously that knock and Cleary 
those guys you'd feel have to be available for Clare to win It's good to hear there is that realism um, about Lohan and the job he's doing because you know it never takes long for grumbles to start and off semi-final again and you know it's it's like Heresy can't walk through Kildare after a bad weekend you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, he, he can speak for himself, but um, no, I mean, like does, every Clare team that took the field this year, Joe, um, you know, whether it was the minors, the twenties, uh, or the seniors, you felt these guys were given one hundred percent for the jersey. Yeah, um, and well and prepared tactically, and no shortcomings, and that that sort uh, of things. Ab- absolutely, you know, absolutely, and um, and you know, and Brian has put the infrastructure in place, you know, around the team to make sure that you know the players, you know one for nothing um, that everything is there and that's not easy given you know the resources that Limerick in particular have, have available to him you yeah, know yeah. but uh, yeah he's I, I, in my mind he's he's done a good job um, and, but great now if we could if we could yeah, you know no, it, it, get beyond the next hurl and, and, and if it, have another crack at Limerick could go in the yeah, final absolutely absolutely who'd be a manager David I suppose is the question <laughs> yeah I heard Billy Sheen there yesterday talking about a 50 hour week and I was trying to trying to work back and it after the He's obviously got bet by down, yeah. but it, it, it is, it's, Jesus, it's, uh, are you, you don't need silverware. Are you, are you doing a 40, 50 hour week with Claire, or were you? I was trying to add it up there. Um, I think even if you're not, just say even physically, if you're not on the pitch, you're still answering phone calls. You're still sending back text messages. Yeah. You, your, your mind, even if you go to bed, you could wake up for an hour and start thinking about it for an hour. So like you can nearly clock that in. Yes, you're not physically on the field or you're not talking to someone but you're thinking about it it, it takes up your whole time if you're looking at and do you count that as billable <laughs> you're gone <laughs> <laughs> last week and now you're talking about paying managers to all this is <laughs> uh, we're on a slippery slope I here. know yeah but I take the point you're, you're, you're preoccupied I would think for it uh, it is it is um I kind of said it there one day, uh, and I remember being at home. Said it like uh, I was, I was having a, bit of, a small bit of an argument with a player, and my mind was completely. I was at the sink. I was completely distracted by just what was I going to say to him the next night at training? Because and I was fuming because we had a bit of an altercation, kind of just even a few words the, the night previous. And I remember then watching my one and a half year old fall backwards down the stairs, like he went tumbling down. I had I just taken my eyes off him. I remember just thinking, Jesus Christ, just get your head together, like. But it's not, you're not present with your kids yeah, even when bet. you are at home. I'll bet. And like I have, I often play. Like I'm delighted when the kids go. Do you want to have a game of hide and seek? It's a three year old because I hide, and I hide for a while. Like I find a good place <laughs> and I have my phone with me, and I'll, I'll start sending, I'll start replying, mess, replying to messages and doing whatever I can, just, so, <laughs> just so that they don't find me for those few minutes. And it's you, you feel so bad. Like even going to bed at night, I don't read. I don't read books to uh, I have a, a lad who'll be two next week but I don't read books to him we watch it could be Carlo Analysis and that's what he watches he yeah. doesn't get you know Baby Shark whatever yeah. that's what he wants yeah. and then we're like I'll get you Baby Shark and then he's there watching Carlo Highlands of, of Mouse Cavan or Chris Nolan banging over the bar like yeah. and he falls asleep looking at that you do feel like um, you do feel like a fraud at times and it's it's yeah, you have to that's why it's, that's why I do love the spit season because you get to kind of step away from it but it, it's tough going uh, it's yeah. tough going when you feel I'll like look, neglecting I'll, I'll bet like I'm laughing because you're just I mean yeah, I, I'd say Shefflin did laugh at plenty of your, of your jokes I'm beginning to realise but um, you know that that's a very special time in your life with your children and you're not going to get it back yeah everyone keeps saying that to you and yeah I, I, and I said a story to, to uh, so I was talking to the Kildare chairman yesterday and uh, you know he, he was asking me was I disappointed I, I can say I said this point of that every year, you know, when it's your, your birthday wish, uh, you're blowing out the candles. I have the same wish every single year. And I said, I want my family to be safe for the year ahead. And I remember then kind of uh, this year I was blowing out the candle and I, I kind of, I thought about it. And then I went, uh, I want us to stay up, Joe McDonough. And that was it. That was to me. I just went, no, this is more important to me. And, I, and again, I felt guilty as hell. And I just went, no, it's, it's so bloody important to me. And you, you do... There's that air of guilt then, kind mm. of, of uh, you're putting everything ahead of your family. And, and it's a big, there are big decisions to make as far as, you know, are you going to go, you know, you're right. These years, you only have them for a certain length of time. You have to try and make the most of it with your family as well. And, and But at the same time, you do love the job that you're at. It's a... Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's tough going, all right. No, it is. Uh, amazing insight. Uh, fellas, we're out of time. Thank you both so much. That was brilliant. Uh, James O'Connor, thank you so much. Pleasure. And, Cheers, Joe. Uh, David, great stuff. Thank you so much. Enjoy okay. a few weeks off uh, over the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Emil. Thanks, Joe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Hurling on Off The Ball With Board Gosh Energy Hurling, it's anyone's game